Then I may hear it to you. Thank you, Zach. Hello, everybody! Yay! I am so excited to be here, but even more so to see so many people here just about uh, under 40 days before this election. You all know the urgency at hand. You all know that this is Archimedes once said, give me the right lever, I can change the world. Well, this is the leverage point right here in Florida. The outcome of this, this state is going to probably determine who controls the United States Senate. You have a big Senate race going on down here. It's going to probably control not just the White House, but as a result of that, the Supreme Court's direction for the next two generations. So much is at stake. Now, I have to tell you, though, we have to start understanding this not in terms of the big challenges of the world, but really what's, what, what your role in that is. Um, I was a kid that grew up with parents telling me those 10 two-letter words. If it is to be, it is up to me. Alice Walker said the most common way people give up their power is not realizing they have it in the first place. And so I'm just here already encouraged by the fact that you guys are here. But what I'm even more encouraged is that you all are willing to put it all on the line, to put it all out there. My father has this terrible apocryphal story. This is, you have to understand, my dad and my mom, I love them so much, and the older they got, they would tell me the same stories over and over again. I would love listening to them because my mom had this penchant for accuracy and detail, so I would learn something new every time my mom would talk. And my father, I loved listening to his stories over and over again because he had this penchant for hyperbole and exaggeration, and the stories would just get better and better every time he would tell them. You know, he was born in the mountains of North Carolina, and the story started off with hail the size of, of golf balls, but then it became baseballs, and it became, then it became like hatchbacks, you know? And, and I still remember my dad one day said to me, son, I remember when the tsunami hit my town. And I'm like, my dad, you're in the mountains of North Carolina, tsunami hit me. And I know you all have relatives like this, because my father didn't admit that he was wrong, he just got indignant. He's like, son, it was a long time ago, before the internet, you can't look it up, but it happened. <laughs> so my father has this one story uh, that is, uh, I'm sure, apocryphal, but let me share it with you. He says that he was a little boy sitting in a, in a, school, in a school, and again, it went from a one-room schoolhouse to eventually a lean-to on the side of a mountain. But he was sitting in school, and, and he said the teacher came in, and the teacher said to them, class, first day of school, Anybody here thinks you're stupid, I want you to stand up right now. And my father said, all the boys and girls didn't move, and the woman stood there impatiently. He said, come on now, you think you're dumb, you think you're stupid, I want you to stand up. And my father said, nobody moved, but the teacher was standing there looking so impatient, he finally pushed his chair back, and he said he stood up proudly. And the teacher looked at him and said, Mr. Booker Boy, what's wrong with you? You think you're dumb, you think you're stupid? And my father said, he scratched his head and said, well, shucks, ma'am, I don't think I'm stupid, but I didn't want you to be the only one standing. <laughs> So this is what my parents taught me, and I know it's what your family taught you, is that this country did not get to be where it is because other people made things happen. This country got to be where it is because ordinary Americans made an extraordinary commitment to make things happen themselves. This gets me inspired to be in a room like this because my parents taught me that this idea of the great man theory of history, that these great men descended from Mount Olympus, Jefferson, Washington, Hamilton, and that's what made America great. The truth of the matter is, we got to where we are because everyday Americans made a commitment, often gathering in small groups, whether it was people in church basements plotting to make sure that the civil rights movement moved forward, whether it was people in storefronts like this working for workers' rights, whether it was people in barnyards uh, uh, and, 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 and barn houses that, that decided, you know what, we're gonna build the greatest infrastructure project in the country's history, which is the Underground Railroad. Mm. It is people in our country that took control, that understood that if it is to be, it is up, if it is to be, it is up to me. Now, this election actually, the, the, if you look at the numbers, we have all the ingredients to win. Yes. The numbers are on our side. But King said it so eloquently, he said the problem today is not the vitriolic words, we've heard a lot in this campaign, not the vitriolic words and the violent actions of the bad people, but it's the appalling silence and inaction of the good people. Yeah. That's what our job is. It's to wake up the moral imagination of our neighbors, expand the consciousness of our community, get people to understand that this is such a critical moment in American history, that we're on a crossroads, and it's not going right or left. This election has nothing to do with parties, I'm telling people. This is an election about going forward or going backwards. 
It's about going to the better angels of our nature or being dragged back down into divisiveness and bigotry and hate. I believe that we as a country are a testimony to what's possible when you bring diverse people together with a common commitment and common values. We're not a country that was founded because we all look alike or because we all pray alike or descend from a common ancestry. We're a nation that was brought together because of our common values and our ideals. And even those founding fathers that I mentioned before, as imperfect as they were, they had a genius to them because when they wrote the Declaration of Independence, when Jefferson wrote it, he ended it with this idea that if we're ever going to make it as a nation, we have to show an uncommon commitment to each other. It was a declaration of independence, but they ended it with this profound declaration of interdependence, where the last words say that in order for this country to make it, in order for this declaration to happen, we have to mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. Now, this is what this is about for me. This election is about a sacred honor. We Americans who drink deeply from wells of freedom and liberty and opportunity that we didn't dig, we Americans who eat lavishly from banquet tables prepared for us by our ancestors, these abundant blessings we can't pay back. The only thing we can do is let these blessings metabolize in our body and become energy to keep fighting forward. Because in this election, there are so many things at stake. There are people in this country who are struggling. Many of us in this room, we may not wear on the outside, but we have family members who are suffering with addiction. We have uh, people that have are struggling with mental health issues. We have kids that might one might have a, a developmental disability. We have somebody that we know is struggling to pay for college. Somebody is working a full-time job but still at or below the poverty line. I can go through all the struggles that are in America that are not, that are big struggles, but they're not greater than who we are as a people. And so I don't want to end just by, by asking you all something that Secretary Clinton uh, began to ask me. I have to tell you the truth. I didn't know Secretary Clinton personally before this election. Um, I decided to support her based upon an intellectual process. You know, I live in Newark, New Jersey right now and have for the last 20 years and live in a neighborhood uh, that uh, has amazing people, but we live, uh, it's a neighborhood, it's a poor neighborhood, it's a struggling neighborhood with a lot of issues. And, and when I get up every morning, I, I get reminded of the urgency of this election and I supported her because of loyalty to my community. I said, hey, she's the right person at the presidency to help us deal with a lot of the challenges. But I got to know Secretary Clinton well, personally, when I started campaigning for her all around the country in the primary, and I made this mistake once with a reporter, and I'm going to admit it to you guys now, and we all make mistakes when we talk. We all say things kind of dumb sometimes, and the, the problem with being a politician is when you say them, they're usually recorded. And, <laughs> and what's even more difficult for me is when I stick my foot in my mouth, I'm like most of you, I've got very big feet. I've got like size 14 feet, so it's very problematic for me. So let me confess to you one time I stuck my feet in my mouth. I'm sitting here in a very serious, serious uh, uh, interview with a reporter, and they're, they're talking to me, and I'm telling them about Secretary Clinton and how passionate I am about the race. And then I declared, let me tell you the moment I fell in love with Secretary Clinton. And then they got very serious, like, you're in love with Secretary Clinton? <laughs> And I'm like, no, strike that, strike that. <laughs> agape love, agape love. <laughs> no, let me tell you a moment that I had on the, um, on, in the primary that was such a powerful moment for me. When I was first getting to know her as a person, I was up in Iowa. You all remember uh, the primaries. And uh, I was running around with her. And we stopped at a diner. And it was this amazing moment for me because we shook hands in the diner, and I was very hungry. <laughs> so we pull off to the side and back little table against the wall to eat, and we sit down. Now, I'm not a judgmental person. I think that sometimes we spend so much time judging that we don't have enough time loving, uh, and I believe that we should always lead with love. Uh, I believe this with leaders. Like you can't lead the people unless you love the people, unless you love all the people. Uh, and sometimes I just listen to politicians, and if I hear them demeaning people, uh, degrading people, um, I can see that they don't love the, love the people. So I have, I'm sorry, I have, that's the standard I have for folks. And in fact, there's this wonderful Dave Barry quote, which I think is so true, where he says, someone who's nice to you, but not nice to the waiter, is not a nice person. And, and, I, I'm a and, so, and so here I am, uh, uh, I, I'm in sitting at this diner with Secretary Clinton, and, and I'm kind of excited because we're just going to chew and chat. And the server comes over 
and she's kind of excited to be uh, 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 serving the secretary. But the secretary gets to do a conversation with her, and this is when I just started witnessing to me what I thought was a really powerful moment for me. And it, it went me, took me from intellectually supporting her to supporting her with a, a, a level of passion and commitment because you know, she and I talk policy all the time. Uh, and I, in fact, right before she started her, her campaign, where her very first policy speech was on criminal justice reform, her office had talked to mine. It's a big issue for me. And, and so intellectually, I was there. But this is where it shifted to, to much more than that, because I watch her and the server start talking. And suddenly, you know, the questions are being asked, like, hey, do you, uh, uh, is this your full-time job? And the server says, no, I, I actually work two jobs. I work this one full-time job and I have to work another one because I make $2.13 an hour plus tips. Um, and it's not enough to raise my kids. Oh, you have kids. And she asks questions. Well, what happens if you get sick? And she, like many food service workers all across this country, come to work sick, prepare our foods. Why? Because we don't have sick leave for so many American workers. And then she's like, well, what happens if your children get sick? And then she says, I have this terrible, terrible crisis. Do I stay home with my sick child? Or do I uh, go to work so I can pay the rent? And the more that the two of them talked, I saw these two moms suddenly connecting, where Secretary Clinton wasn't talking in the way that we, she and I, and I have talked in policy walk speech. This was two people talking heart to heart about issues. And I suddenly got it right then. That this is a person that's not running for president because of ambition. This is not a person that just, hey, wants to have a title. This is a person that knows that purpose is more important than position. This is a person that knows that there is a cause of our country, unfinished business, that there is work to do. So that everybody has a fair shot in this country to cultivate their genius, to raise their children, to, be, to achieve their dreams. I still remember walking out of that diner, understanding Secretary Clinton so much more uh, than I did going into that diner. That for her, it's not about her, it's about us and this country that we're gonna be. So I want you all to know that she and I started a little joke uh, in Iowa where um, I would go up to introduce her and we would be walking there and you know she had heard me say some introductions beforehand and she started saying to me, uh, Corey, Corey, she would say, um, I want you to give him the full Cory Booker when you introduce him. <laughs> and, and, and I'd look at her, and her staff, who was very afraid that I would do like typical politicians, speak a long time, would say something like to me, you have two minutes to introduce the secretary. <laughs> and so she, the first time she says this to me, we were walking in, and she goes, Cory, I want you to give him the full Cory Booker. And I'm like, Secretary Clinton, um, they, your staff told me I only have two minutes. And she looks at me almost like just disappointed in me. She's like, Cory, I'm in charge. <laughs> and so I went out there and just let it let it go, and this would continue literally to the to the um, to the night that she called me up uh, Friday night before the convention. She calls me up uh, and and she's like, "How's the speech going?" And I'm telling, "Well, you know, I'm wrestling with your folks." And then she goes, "Court, court, I want you to go out there, give them the full court." <laughs> And so that night, literally, I ripped up the speech. I told them, I'm sorry, guys. I'm writing what I want to write. And I spent an all-nighter. And, and that, that led to my convention. So what I really want to do right now is just flip the script a little bit. And I want to be Secretary Clinton. And I want you to be me for a second. And what I want to ask from you guys right now is with these last, last weeks of this election, I want you to give them the full who you are. I want you to give them the full measure of your commitment, the full measure of your passion, the full measure of your heart, the full measure of your spirit. Because at the end of the day, these final days in this election, in this state, if you give the fullness of yourself, I promise you we're going to win Florida. And if we win Florida, we're going to win the presidency. Folks, 
Do I have time for selfies? Yes. yes. Yeah.